What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the altar again. And this time we are here with October Nar. We are here with Tom, Tyler, and Doug. Thank you so much for being here today. It's great to have you all here. Good Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, anytime, anytime. It's so great to have you here. Letters to Existence is the new album. It's absolutely kick ass. Now, uh, I was telling you, Tom, uh, before Tyler and Doug walked in, um, but like I was saying, where's this band been all my life? You're one of the bands where until I got like the press release and the info, I didn't really know of. I saw you guys recently played at Lucky 13. I sadly had to miss you guys, but um, I went back and listened to you know some of your previous albums, and this is a whole catalog that like I just got lost into. So, would you say Letters to Existence is continuing in a similar vein? Is this like sort of like a new beginning for October Nar in a way, and it's almost kind of like uh, taking a new approach? Yeah, it's uh, well, I wouldn't say a new approach. Um, there was a lot that we did with uh, the first album, especially where um, we were using a lot of uh, typo influence, heavy typo influence, uh, to kind of get the message out there and across of what direction it was going to go. So when we came into the third album, it was really a, uh, a decision to sit down and say, all right, hey, let's get away from all of that. Let's let's just write directly from what we have uh, inside of us and the influences outside of and therein and, uh, and really focus and hone in on what we were trying to, to aim for. Um, in the South. Mm. Anyone want to add to that? Um, yeah, with the, uh, with the last album, uh, that was the first time really where we had, uh, more than just Tom on the writing floor. So, uh, I joined shortly after the second album, uh, dropped and, uh, yeah, I came in and I, I helped with the writing for the, uh, the third album. And, uh, this uh, upcoming one, Letters to Existence. Hmm. And uh, now we have Tyler, who uh, came in shortly. Was it before or after Fate, Wine, and Wisteria? Was right before. after. Right after, yeah. yeah. Okay, so Tom is the only OG member from 13 to now. Yeah, we're, we're just in a... Uh, <laughs> we're in a uh, process of discovering our, uh, our full lineup. <laughs> as it is right now people have been coming and going <laughs> yeah. but we think the three of us are definitely going to be sticking around we're we're trying to get our fourth yeah fair enough i mean it happens to every single band i can only think of like two three bands off the top of my head that never ever changed a member uh rammstein is one uh thrice is the other and then duran gray which is one of my personal favorites so yeah shout out oh, to yeah. thrice oh yeah huge shout out to thrice um, but, you know, when I listen to, like, Fate, Fate Wine and, and Wisteria and I listen to, you know, tracks such as Wine or uh, tracks such as uh, Windows, etc., like, you know, I without a doubt see the typo influences there. I mean, your usages of green is clearly, you know, makes it noticeable. But I see, like, a lot of other elements of gothic in your sound ranging from, you know, other gothic metal bands like Paradise Lost to... Uh, you know, My Dying Bride to like a lot of classic goth acts even predating Typo. So w is it fair to say that there are other influences beyond Typo Negative within your sound? Absolutely, absolutely. There's, there's Def Leppard influences, there's Bush influences, there's, you know, there's all kinds of different stuff just from uh, the things that I was into growing up. So, you know, you know, a lot of people, when they hear things, they just kind of scratch the surface and usually, you know, Typo is going to come out of that uh, primarily, which I'm fine with. I mean, you know, they were a great band, so uh, you don't have that kind of music anymore either. And uh, a lot of what I brought into Fate, Wine, and Wisteria were a lot of Opeth and Baroque music influences. I hear like, that, uh, too. I hear, yeah, specifically I hear in, uh, in Proverbs, um, the, uh, the last keyboard solo, I actually did that. And uh, then the, uh, the references to uh, uh, Hieronymus Bosch and Mozart, I mean, uh, but when it comes to Opeth, uh, Still Life or Blackwater Park? Uh, I gotta go Blackwater Park. Yeah. I'm Same. Like, yeah, my, you know, it's, it's so hard to choose from those, from uh, their mid-career discography. There were so many bangers. Oh, God. Well, who, who's Opeth? I'm not familiar. <laughs> Uh, who, who is who is Opeth? You, I was about to kick you out of the Zoom and say, "Go listen." Smartest. I know it's Doug's favorite band, so I'm trying to give him some yeah. help. And Tyler, yeah, right? and Tyler, I actually got a tattoo. Oh fuck, fuck! Hey, I got my favorite band tattooed, Lacuna Coil. So you know, oh man, yeah. I love Lacuna Coil, dude. But hell yeah. 
Um, I still don't think anything will top Kamali's. Yeah, well, I'll fight to the death on that later. But uh, <laughs> Ty, uh, Tyler, your rhythmic contributions to the band is also uh, very impressive as well. So, what are like some of your uh, influences for drumming in a way? Because I feel like with you know this sort of sound, there's a lot of ways that the rhythm fluctuates, where you have to you know embrace the slower aspects, but also go full on yeah. heavy into you know the real heavy and faster aspects. So, is there like different yeah. influences that are channeled into your drumming? Well, every time I sit down. I want it to I want it to have the grace of him with the fills of Woods of Be Prey or Swallow the Sun. So uh, you know, I mean a lot of the things that we do are very straightforward. So I look to him in that aspect, which is my favorite band. But I kinda I, w- I would love to channel the fills of like a Swallow the Sun, Woods of Be Prey, um, some bands like that. So-, so I like I like to keep it solid, but have some some moments in there to to stand out keep it solid and keep it depressing i gotta say your list of influences all of you uh have probably the most depressing influences and i love it your your music (laughs) your music is the sound of a morning of cigarettes and coffee um thank you that that's that's very nice (laughs) i mean it is a comment i like that that's the first i've heard that i was i was winging it um but um, one thing I am curious too is with like the lyricism that's incorporated in here as well. Like, has is October Noir like a very conceptually driven band? Because you have an album titled Thirteen, which you know we've seen that number before, but it seems like every band that has that as a song title or an album title uh, have like a different meaning behind it. But then with a with an album title like Fate, Wine, and Wisteria, I feel like that that almost kind of has its own sort of essence of gluttony within behind it uh, behind it in a way and then my interpretation of letters to existence is almost kind of like in a way like very uh, misanthropic out uh, misanthropic perception of reality and this is just my interpretation but would you say after making this the longest question I've ever asked on this channel would you say that the lyrically is coming from a more personal place or is there a lot of external sources of inspiration No, all of it's personal. Um, so in 13, the, the whole, that whole album dealt more with uh, family. So the, the concept behind that was uh, the 13 clans from Vampire, the Masquerade. So that's where the number came from. And we, we, like in the artwork, we hid all of the little uh, symbolic emblems of, of each clan from, from that. So it, uh, it dealt with death and uh, just the falling outs, uh, the usual shit people go through. So going into Fate Wine was <clears throat> more about um, I don't know, finding finding peace and love and power and and uh, just life stuff, man. You know, it, it dealt a lot more on the side of women. And then uh, led us to existence was just kind of uh, existence was kind of questioning the uh, meaning of life. <laughs> Did, was that inspired by recent events, which is at this point the most cliche interview question ever? But yeah, I think uh, each album because I had it's like its own little timeline of my life. And in terms of how you guys uh, lay with the music in a way, like uh, with Doug and Tyler, do you like almost have to put yourself in Tom's shoes in order to sort of resonate and know how you're going to convey melody and rhythm within the sound? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, I think that. I think that um, we we kind of start out with a bass with a bass track, kind of like an idea. It it doesn't take long. It, I don't. Ha- I definitely don't have to adjust myself at all. It, it all flows. I think that this album there's there's a lot more pain and uh, a lot more pain and suffering than is really shown on this album. This has definitely been a trying uh, trying season for the band, but. It's gonna be a good one. I think this yeah, is one of the most solid, most solid offerings that we have. You want to say something, Doug? Uh, yeah, and I was gonna say, you know, a lot of it comes with like uh, having a well-tuned ear for like each other's musicals, musical style, and everything like that. You know, just coming together to make music. We've uh, we've had the practice in doing that before, so we can kind of, you know, we know where we're going with that. But also. Uh, I live with Tom. He's actually here in the other room. Oh, wow. um, so we share big portions of our lives. So it's very uh, it's very easy to uh, get into each other's headspace when it comes to writing music. 
Was there at all a vision musically or lyrically with Letters to Existence? Was there a vision that was sort of revolving around this album or was it a very like improvisational songwriting process? Yeah, it just, it all kind of fell in place with uh, maybe with whatever I was feeling at the time and wanted to convey uh, song-wise, but a lot of it didn't really start coming together until the end where, you know, I was like, well, I want, I want to do a song that has so much change in it <clears throat> that it's like motioning and moving through the seasons. And initially, I think the concept was we were going to call it Saws, which just, you know, it kind of abbreviated each, uh, each season. But then we decided to split it off and then make it its own little entities to, uh, to go through the album. But, um, yeah, the whole fall kind of process to it was kind of the baseline. Um, and it just, yeah, it just kind of took off from there, I guess. I don't know. I, did, I don't really pre-plan like a big thing. It's just things kind of fall into place as it moves along. Mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to see individually because we all, again, hold typo negative as a influence on here. So do we have a favorite typo negative album and why? Mm. Yeah, I gotta say, I mean, I, I got to say October Rust. Okay. I know it's cliche, but, you know, I think that's that's when they hit their peak. Okay. Just so many good songs. Okay. All right. Anybody want to add? Is, I'm guessing for the rest is Bloody Kisses or Slow, Deep, and Hard for the for the OGs? I don't know. I, I, would, I, would, say, I would say October Rust as well. Uh, I think Life is Killing Me actually holds a close second. That's my number one favorite, so I, that's why I ask. Cause I mean, they're they're uh, they're one and the same to me, on on the pedestal. Okay, fair enough. You have the best taste so far. What about you, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first one would be Bloody Kisses. I'm sorry, October Ross, and then Bloody Kisses, and then World Coming Down. Okay. Um, I think October Ross, because of of my goth influence coming up in life, captured the most elements of that and combined it with <clears throat> uh, the the heavier riffs. So yeah, I think that one spoke the best. I wanted to touch upon this, like on, I, I, and I like all three of your inputs on this too. I've had this discussion before on bands that have been labeled sort of goth because Typo Negative has been labeled as goth, Lacuna Coil has been labeled as goth, but they sound nothing like Bauhaus or Sisters of Mercy. And then you know you see a lot of bands like Catatonia or My Dying Bride or Paradise Lost being labeled as gothic in a way. So I see many different styles of bands being labeled as gothic sometimes they have an imagery surrounding it that sort of ties it together but what would you, is there a key principle in the sound of the music aside from it being very depressing that uh has to make it goth i think big organs uh is a big thing choir voices um when you, when you really start looking at like catholicism <clears throat> especially uh you know the big church things uh and they're considered more goth elements i think that's that's the big one that's kind of plagues what you would consider goth. All right. But um, yeah, I think more for me, like in keyboard work, uh, Cradle of Filth was a big influence. Um, but they, again, I would consider that more gothier tones. I, do I consider Typo negative goth? No, I don't. I think they were, the hardcore was uh, their roots, and I think that kind of stayed so, pretty solid through there, especially the Beatles influence too, though. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's funny you mentioned that too, because... I mean, I consider typo negative to be somewhat goth in a way. Like, I, it just comes to my mind at this point. Um, I, when I hear the word goth, I do think of somebody who looks like Peter Steele and the way that, you know, Josh presented himself and Kenny and uh, Sal and Johnny. But I think um, really when you look at, like, Slow, Deep, and Hard, it's almost basically like a hardcore song, uh, but, like, extended and, like, lengthened more. So it's funny you mentioned that, too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you look at Slow Deep and Hard, um, a lot of the songs were more hardcore, but they would have these moments where they would introduce those goth elements. And of course, by, Buddy, by the time Bloody Kisses came around, that was way shifted in, in more of a goth lean. Um, I think that just had a lot to do with each influence at the time. Yeah. What are you, Doug and Tyler, what are your takes on what makes something gothic? Well, um, I would I would have to say that a lot of uh, a lot of the things that like lean us more into that realm is kind of like 
you know, an attitude towards like the grim fascination with death and the supernatural. You know, there's um, there's other cultural elements that uh, that go into the theming of uh, that body of music, and I think we capture a lot of that in uh, in our music as well. One hundred percent. That's the first thing I notice when I uh, when I listen to the music. So we got the conceptual side and the technical side. Tyler, what do you got? <laughs> I'll tell you what makes goth, uh, keyboards, slowness, and melody. So if you have keyboards, if you play slow relatively at all, uh, the melodies are the biggest thing. You know, uh, there's a lot of bands out there that just, I mean, you know, even, even a band like All That Remains, they have melody, but it's not goth, right? Yeah. Um, there's a big, there's a big, dis- like, uh, there's a big way to distinguish between the two. So I'd say keyboards slowness melody and look slow that's what makes things goth slow deep and hard that's what it does there you go (laughs) well even if you compare it to like the cure uh you know the cure they they were more poppy um but i think his imagery and the way he portrayed himself was uh considered to be more goth and now they're just considered a goth band yeah i i i don't know like it's funny because the cure is one of those bands to me the cure and radiohead are the two bands i think of the top of my head maybe i'll put smashing pumpkins in there too where yeah their melody works if you are both very sad or very happy and i think that's mm-hmm. like tonight tonight the melody in that song is very very peaceful it's joyful but it's also very sad and reminiscing you take a band like the cure i mean they're depressing, but they have their very poppy elements behind it as well. Oh, I would put the Smiths in there as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We got to think, I mean, the Cure, the Cure's had 40 years, right? So they've been through all kinds of changes. But I mean, on, on the same album as the most depressing song they've ever written was the most poppiest as well. So they kind of catered to all aspects of that, and it always worked, yeah. which is which is why the Cure is probably the most brilliant band ever. Yeah. And one band that's really uh, bringing the goth sound but has a positive sort of melody right now is this new band, On To Others. I don't know if anybody's been checking them out or listening to them, but I think they're one of the best new bands out there. And they have yeah. like, this sort of like positive sort of goth energy behind them. Yeah, they were uh, they were very Sisters of Mercy sounding to me. Yeah, I see a lot of that too. I miss Sisters of Mercy and The Cure in New York City this year, and that really uh, cuts oh. my knife. But he- here's the sort of debate. Does goth have to be dark yes yeah well uh, not necessarily i, I, I think, think that's the whole elements of it well you can get the element like you can do something instrumentally right um and it could sound dark but then you can write really happy-go-lucky lyrics and it, people will probably still look at it as a golf sense but then you could have a really happy melody and flip it with very dark and depressive lyrics and then then, then they're not going to look at it as a goth song so we're talking about positive influence goth yep exactly (laughs) like like a like a hate breed of goth exactly exactly (laughs) imagine imagine um imagine peter Steele singing uh 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 peter Steele singing like a hate breed song yeah not my master this day is worth living this fight is worth fighting yeah i can't see it (laughs) <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and hey, there are plenty of great hardcore bands like Barrier Dead that have the hardcore sound to it but are depressing as fuck. So Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have two more questions for you, but when it comes to your live presence, again, I do regret uh, missing you guys at Lucky 13 because I checked you guys out and you're phenomenal. But is there a similar energy that's channeled into your live presence as you do when you're songwriting? Absolutely. Uh, I think perfecting the live setting is just as important as perfecting the albums as, as much as we possibly get it. Um, personally, I, I'm trapped behind the microphone, so a lot of times I don't get to come behind it. I feel like I'm boring on stage. Um, so that that's always something in the mix. So we, tr- we tend to focus more on atmosphere for light shows and, and whatever's happening uh, musically to really push more in the experience on the live end. Is, uh, and as, yeah, I think. Oh yeah, please. I was, I was gonna say, I, I think that we're better a lot of than we are on, on tape, that, on uh, on album. That that's hell of a way of marketing and, uh, album. Yeah, I mean, I do. I feel like uh, I feel like I enjoy listening to our uh, even like the shitty videos of our live sets better than our songs. It, it just it always works out. Wow, 
and uh, I'm a big fan. Of, I'm a big fan of of us as well. But it, it always translates better. I think I think that you really you can really feel the the impact of it live as opposed to on on album. But yeah, but for me, like watching a band like a live on video or like a live album to me, I've always said that that's sort of like pornography on the radio, like. <laughs> so yeah so so you so you dove in and tried to find the bootlegs of your favorite bands back in the torrent days yep exactly exactly absolutely i still got my lime wire files and, that's uh, right <laughs> aids exactly AIDS. cyber aids and uh doug is there just anything you wanted to add to that too about the live presence um no i mean the other guys pretty much covered it i mean i i do gotta say that i do prefer like rather than listening to the albums themselves i do prefer listening back to like videos of like uh of our uh performances live because there's always memories attached to them you know we meet so many cool people doing these shows yeah definitely i mean it's always great when you can uh, reflect on a specific show date and you could associate it with another good thing that happened in your life because of that show Mm -hmm. it's it's motivation to keep going yep absolutely so before we go, I want to thank you all so much for your time today. And most of all, thank you for continuing to give us kick-ass new music. I, again, your whole catalog is fantastic. And I can't wait for the rest of the world to hear Letter to Existence and really uh, discover you guys more. Is there just uh, anything else with October Nar that you'd like to promote uh, with the release of this new album in terms of upcoming shows or what else we could be expecting? Go ahead, Doug. Oh, um, so we recently just picked up uh, something here in Pensacola. Um, we're going to be playing the uh, Vampire Ball at uh, De Luna's in, on uh, October 7th. And then the week after that, we're heading out to Arizona to uh, play for uh, a uh, uh, birthday party at the Blues. Uh, that's not Congregation of the Rotten, is it? No, that one got canceled. Okay. Yeah, that, that one got canceled. Um, but yeah, we're going, uh, we're going out west. Oh, hell yeah. That's a hell of a birthday party as well. But thank you so much, everybody. We are here with October Noir. Be sure to check out their new album, Letters to Existence. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time.